Hey everyone, welcome to Bomb in the Air with Scoops and the Wolf. Of course, now we are joined by a non-wolf. We have we have let one in temporarily, although I failed to find out if this person has a nickname that I could have introduced them by. But I guess I can call them by their real name. Just I guess it's Nathan Vella. Is that is that what they call you? That's actually my nickname. I'm Nathan, <laughs> Nathan Vella. Vella. Was the uh, uh, co-founder and president of Cappy Games, correct? Yeah. That makes it sound way more important than it really is. But. I was, well, just before we started, I was like, I have to double check what Nathan's title is. I don't actually know what it is offhand. <laughs> and it's in your Twitter bio, but it's a very impressive sounding title. Yeah, it's, I don't, that, that doesn't really make much sense. I do a lot less than that suggests. <laughs> Also, let's be honest here. We're calling him a non-wolf, but he has much more thick and luxurious hair than I do. Like, he is much more of a wolf than, than I am at this point. Well, different, you know, different wolves for different wolf packs. Yeah, fair enough. Alex, how was your weekend? Uh, not too bad. Busy as hell, actually. Like, I, I, I usually try not to do anything on weekends, uh, but I, I ended up moving a bunch of stuff into storage, helping another person move, uh, furniture shopping doing a variety of things that were not involved, that did not involve video games, which I was not okay with, did not enjoy that one bit. Um, Unacceptable. I know, right? Like, it's the weekend. That's when you're supposed to just sit around and play video games. But I had to, like, do things, and that is that is some absolute bullshit. Um, but in there, I did manage to squeeze in uh, some more Hearthstone, which I will not belabor since we've already talked at length about that game. Uh, and I also managed to squeeze in a fair amount of Mario Kart 8, which was uh, I imagine you're not allowed to talk about. Uh, I I don't know because like I've seen multiple people who are also reviewing that game, sort of talking in fairly broad terms about it uh, on 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 social media. So I'm just going to talk about it in fairly broad terms as well and say, hey, that is seriously some Mario Kart right there in that game that they have called Mario Kart Eight. Some yeah. Real party. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, to, to be fair, like, you could be talking about any Mario Kart game. It just yeah. might happen to apply to Mario Kart 8. Yeah, let's just say I sunk a fair number of hours into it this weekend, even though the embargo for that game is not until uh, 10 days from now. So uh, I, I did not have a problem continuing to play that with whatever free hours I had this weekend. Uh, the embargo was on the 15th. You will learn more then. I, mm. need, I need some Mario Kart in my life. It's a it's I'm excited about a new one because I did not particularly care for the Wii one. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and, you know, we're still kind of in that phase, weirdly enough, where we are slowly seeing new Mario or new Nintendo franchises in high definition for the first time. Yeah, yeah. The, the Wii one was not great. Uh, the 3DS one was pretty good. Uh, I think there's only one, maybe two of the Wii courses that found their way in as the uh, the classic courses. Most of it's stuff from like the DS games and the the N64. So uh, it's a pretty it's a good collection of courses. I'm stoked on that part. I'm yeah. also stoked to not play it with a floaty wheel thing. Yeah, yeah, that was never a good idea. And it, I mean, it's it's just so contradictory to my entire experience with the entire. Like series. I mean, we still play Super Nintendo Mario Kart here, uh, yeah. and that like sitting down with controllers and bumping people on purpose rather than accidentally doing it because you can't really figure out how to hold a wheel. I'm just uh, genuinely excited about a new one with a controller. Even though like you probably could have played the Wii one with a controller, I don't know. Um, you don't could. Know. You could only. Weirdly enough, you could only play it with. Um... Like if you had the Wii remote and a and, and a nunchuck attached to it, so you couldn't just use the Wii remote in order to play the Wii version, which is part of the reason why I find that game infuriating. You can use the Wii remote, but you have to use the motion controls. Like they, there's no way to just flip on use the D-pad to control uh, your character, which is like, infuriating. <laughs> I feel like that's not true, though. I feel like there is a setting for that somewhere because I'm pretty sure I just played it with the Wii remote, but I could be totally wrong about that. I also haven't played the Wii version in at least two years at this point, so... The the chat will... They'll yell about it. Three seconds and the internet will solve that for us. Yeah, yeah. yeah dude, don't worry. When we're wrong, there are plenty of people ready to tell us <laughs> how wrong we are. Uh, so, Nathan, like, do you even find time to play video games in like the lead-up to the launch of a new video game, given that you guys just announced on Friday that 
Super Time Force is uh, finally coming out after 10 years of development uh, in, on uh, May 14th. 10 years of development. Yeah, um, yeah, we were, Friday was pretty crazy. Uh, it's, it's awesome to be able to tell people that it's actually for real coming. Uh, but in response to the do I find time to play, I don't find time to do a anything at all right now. Uh, I made the the big mistake of also moving or getting ready to move around this time. So oh God. launching video game on two platforms plus moving plus travel, it's it's been a little crazy, but it's the right kind of crazy. Uh, it's like I would rather have it be this kind of crazy than uh, not be launching the game in under two weeks. So it's hard to kind of complain. I have found some time to squeeze in Monument Valley and some Fract as well. Um, cool. Although I haven't actually been playing Fract, I've mostly just been walking around aimlessly in it, listening to music and watching neon landscapes light up, but that game is legit. Yeah. So what is, you know, like, seriously though, like, Super Time Force is one of those games that feels like we've been hearing about for a long time. Oh, you have been hearing about it for a long time. That's that is actually historical data. How many PAXs has that game been at at this point? <laughs> five. It five. Was five PAXs. I uh, I talked to I talked to Chris Hacker. Um, I believe that we have more PAXs than than uh, than Spy Party because he doesn't do PAX East. So uh, yeah, we showed it at the very first time that we showed it was at PAX East, uh, like three two PAX East ago, three PAX East ago. I can't even remember now. Um, and that we had been working on the game for maybe like 40 days total or something like that when we showed it. Um, the whole development of the game started at a game jam, was kind of this pet project um, of three people at the studio, and when we started actually working on it, it was only on Fridays. So from like September, like hell, August until uh, PAX East, so that's August to like March, uh, it was only four days a month that we were actually working on the game. Um, so that, you know, kind of messed up the entire schedule, and then at the point that we started showing it and signed it with Microsoft for Xbox 360, we were still only really working on it a day or two a week, um, and that didn't change until maybe uh, eight, nine months in, almost ten months into the project. Um, so the, like, the reason why people have been hearing about it for a long time and the reason why we've been working on it for a long time is because it's was three people for four days a month and then four people for like a week a month and then we just kind of did this crazy like rise up of development and it's only really had a full team on it for a year or so so it's uh, uh, in hindsight not the most uh, time sensitive way to develop a video game uh, but it actually <laughs> worked out really well for us because had we not had like the time for that game to, to like proof and then brown up in the oven, I think it would have turned out to be a lot less radical than it actually did. Now, for the for the benefit of those who in the chat who maybe haven't been paying attention for the last five PAXs, in which case, what the fuck have people been doing? Uh, could you just give the, the quick log line of what, what uh, Super Time Force is all about? Yeah, Super Time Force is kind of a run-and-gun uh, platformer, kind of in the same vein of a Contra or a Gunstar Heroes. Uh, but with a time-traveling twist. So every time you die, or whenever you actually want to, just by pressing the B button, you can enter timeout mode, which is kind of like taking control of a VHS, and you can scrub through the timeline, choose where you want to enter back in time, choose a new character, and then dive right back in. But all of your past lives or your past selves are playing alongside you. So it's you're basically playing co-op with your past lives. Um, and there's a lot of uh, explosions. Uh, there's a skateboard riding dinosaur. There's a dolphin character named Dolphin Lundgren. Uh, you can play as a piece of shit. Uh, you can, <laughs> you, it's really, really challenging. But they, I mean, the, the kind of like the big hook for the game. The reason why we're so excited about it is it's a like tough as nails run and gun platformer, which by itself I think is super fun. Um, but the fact that you're kind of teaming up with and, and playing alongside the past versions of yourself, you create like an army of yourself, and so death becomes the main gameplay mechanic in the game, which, you know, it's, it's a super, like, kind of, you know, throwback-y, old-school inspired type game in a lot of ways, but we really feel like the design behind it is, like, super bonkers and, uh, you know, very different than anything that's been in a 2D platformer in a long time. I didn't. I didn't know 
Denver the Last Dinosaur was such a big thing in Canada. Oh gosh, is it like like the coolest stuff ever? <laughs> uh, Denver the is that Last a, is that a Canadian dinosaur? export that I'm unaware of? Yes, it's it's funny because I don't know how much of an influence he actually paid. It was uh, most of the influence for Zachasaurus was actually Poochie. Um, perfect, fucking perfect. Basically, like take Poochie except turn him into a dinosaur instead of a dog, and that was that was a big uh, that was where we kind of that was the starting point for that character. But mostly, the starting point for everything in the game is dumb jokes and like eighties, nineties references. Uh, the game's all about us having a chance to dive into our stupid studio sense of humor. Because we haven't, I mean, sorcery is kind of funny. Uh, you know, there were some jokes in Clash of Heroes. Critter Crunch had rainbow barfing, but we've never had a chance to, like, hit it really hard. And, and this game is, like, I think it's funny because it's all of our sense of humors. And, you know, people, I think, will get it, maybe, and some of them will not get it, and that's maybe almost better. Is that something you guys have been itching to kind of get out there for a while? Because, I mean, oh. like you said, Super Brothers was, you know, it, it had some very clever, funny stuff in it, but, you know, that wasn't necessarily the crux of the whole game. And Critter Crunch was just really cute. Yeah. Like, have you guys just been itching to just get out there and just be like, look, we are crazy assholes and we want everyone to know it? I think every as uh, yes, that totally is exactly it. But I think every aspect of the game is the, like, we are crazy assholes. I mean, it's a... Like, it's a crazy game. There's 0% of it that is not a lot of bullets and death and explosions and 16 different types of characters all on the screen at once. Um, so the jokes part of it, the, like, cutscenes and the reason why you're time traveling and the goals or missions behind the game, uh, they're just kind of like one layer of that extremely stupid, uh, crazy onion that is Super Time Force. There was actually... Like crazily enough, uh, at GDC this year, uh, one of the his name has escaped me. One of the lead designers on Super Time Force, he gave a talk, right? Uh, Kenneth. Kenneth is the the he actually came up with the concept at at uh, the Game Jam, and he's the like lead gameplay programmer, lead programmer. Yeah. He yeah, was he was, about... yeah, he was the one also like for 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 the Jaimao audience. Uh, he came with and showed Super Time Force. <laughs> at this point. Uh, two years ago, uh, when you guys came down for uh, our big uh, our big live, live live show to, yeah. to show that game off, uh, so Kenneth was the one that came down with you to show that. But yeah, yeah, explain explain what his GDC talk was about. He was he kind of went off the deep end. Um, time travel, even in like a simple two D platformer, is crazy complex, and there is actually like a, a lot of like physics components to it, and like, we actually have code in the game that deals with the butterfly effect. We actually have code in the game that deals with the idea of, like, desynchronizing time in general. I mean, it's, it's, his entire talk was about how, to, how we solve all of these kind of, like, really major, like, physics time travel problems in video game form. And in some cases, uh, Ken just totally breaks them uh, and makes them work better for players. And in other cases, they're actually, like, legit solutions to time travel problems or potential time travel problems. <laughs> the game so if time, itself... If, if, so if time travel gets invented, Kenneth is going to get a footnote as being a, a step along the way. I totally agree. I think most people will, will mark this as, as a line in the sand. This is where time travel really starts. I have to imagine that resolving a lot of those contradictions makes QA on a game like this kind of a nightmare. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's another one of the advantages of having a little bit of a longer schedule, and uh, we're lucky that we have uh, a QA lead in the studio. Uh, Christian has been playing the game for, like, two years now. Um, so we were able to bang out a lot of those kind of, like, giant gameplay breaking, this game is not fun anymore bugs uh, really early on. Um, and then we had some help along the way from from other QA studios, but it's yeah. I mean, the whole the whole project seems like it's it's really like one of those things that's totally transparent to players, right? Like the game when you play it looks cohesive and and like it looks like this thing that was just built uh, very simply and very tightly, uh, and that's fine. Like it's it's actually kind of one of my favorite things about video games is how abstracted development is in a way, but. 
at the same time, it's it's hard to talk about Super Time Force without talking about the crazy complexities of developing a game with time travel in it, where you can play as like a whole bunch of different characters that affect the world in a different way, and nothing about it was as simple as I think it, it looks. And that's that's why we liked making the game. That's why we put so much into it. That's why we kind of busted our asses to make it into something more than just a, a jokey kind of gimmick game. How, how do you guys feel about that part? Because that's specifically the, the idea that, you know, it, when Super Time Wars comes out, if someone has never heard of it, they just happen to be loading up the Xbox store, you know, they download it, and uh, they have a good time with it. Uh, obviously, you know, there's a lot of complexities underneath the surface that allow you to play this seemingly simple game, uh, but a lot of the, obviously a lot went into it. Uh, you know, this is something Alex and I have talked about, we've talked about a lot with a, a lot of other developers, is that, you know, game development is sort of a black box, uh, I think, to uh, a lot of players, even ones that, you know, play a lot of games and, and, and try to know a lot more about how games are made. How, do you guys think about that, you know, when you're presenting your games, when you're talking about games, about how you try and, and better let players know how they're made, or is that really not that important to you? Well, it's, it's super important uh, to me, like us as a studio, uh, in a big way because our studio is made up of people who had never made games before. I mean, we're a 22-person studio, and three of the people on staff had ever made a game before they started working at Cappy. Um, so the idea of like kind of getting out of that black box of telling people like it's it is here's the process here's how it's done super important but at the same time I don't think that that should be uh, like it's not our focus either if people are interested we're here to talk about it we're super happy to talk about it and we'd love to you know have more of that discussion go through but at the same time if people don't give a shit then that's also okay that's the I think one of the best parts about games or any real entertainment medium is there's like different layers to which you can actually enjoy them and um, that's why it was really cool for Ken to be able to speak at GDC about the kind of ultra complexity of the systems inside of a game that looks so simple but I mean I think we're also really lucky that like Double Fine and two player productions have kind of started breaking down some of the walls and early access helps a lot on Steam for breaking down some of the walls and I mean, even, like, I've been on NeoGAF for, like, 10 years, and there's a lot of developers. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. It's, I, <laughs> I love that place. Uh, it's it's a wonderful uh, rabbit hole to dive in, and it's also kind of freaky. But yeah. um, but it's, all, it's, it's amazing because I, I met, like, four or five of my developer friends on NeoGAF, but I met them through somebody asking them a question that's much more specific than what's the release date, why isn't it coming to PS4? Um, and the developers went deep and, and explained it to them. And I think that's that's why I like video games. That's one of the things that I really enjoy about it is, you know, if somebody wants to know how friggin' complex Super Time Force is, send Ken an email, tweet at him, and he will go bonkers explaining everything that's going on in that game. But if you just want to pick up Time Force and, and blow up some robots, and that's super awesome, too. I, I guess I... It's a, uh, it's fun that way. I mean, I think there's a, it's the same way that I consume music. I'm the least musically inclined human on earth, um, and I don't even know how most of it is done. But I have such a high appreciation for the stuff that I like that I don't feel like I'm misinformed. So, as a president of a company, even if you say that makes you sound too important, it still sounds, <laughs> it still sounds awfully important. I, so obviously you're not in like mucking in code on a day-to-day -day basis, but what does that what does that encompass for you know a 22 person studio? Like what do what do you do on a daily on a daily basis? Um, it it shifts a lot depending on what's going on at the studio. Uh, when we're launching a game, uh, it's very different than when we're kind of like early on in production. Um, so lately, I've been doing a lot of like product management, production management stuff, like because we have a giant bug database filled with tasks that need to get completed, just, uh, you know, kind of making sure that everyone is on the same page, making sure the work that's being done is the most important work and the stuff that needs to be done the soonest, uh, stuff that players will see 99% of the time that they play rather than the stuff that they see 1% of the time. Um, and then at the same time, it's working with Microsoft to figure out how and when the game is going to be released, how and when the game is going to be promoted on their platforms, 
Um, and then it's working with, like, internally as well on promoting the game and getting the game out there and working with, you know, artists to create art and a bazillion other things. Um, and then at the same time, it's also, you know, preparing for next projects, uh, working on different stuff uh, on the business side for whatever comes next. I mean, it's, I, I think that 90% of my work is kind of behind a curtain. Uh, I send a lot of emails and I do a lot of spreadsheet working. Uh, <laughs> talk on the phone a bunch. Uh, but it's, a lot of the work is about, you know, uh, making sure that what's happening now is being done the right way and setting up what's happening next. I guess that's the, the easiest way for me to kind of define it. And then uh, the other flip side of it is that I do, like I get to work a lot with Chris, our creative director, or the other co-founders who are running different sides of the studio. Um, it's a lot of communication work too, like just talking to people. And at, at the studio, we're, we're actually like a super loud, then super quiet, then super loud. And when it's super quiet, a lot of the discussion is, you know, sending files back and forth on a on Skype, and when it's loud, it's it's clapping and yelling and trying to uh, not freak out too much about how awesome I think the games are and try to be professional um, instead of, you know, freaking out because I really love the stuff that we're making and it's hard not to freak out. Tell me more about these spreadsheets. Uh, let's see here. What's the latest one? that I, um, I've, st I've started to try to color code them as ugly as possible. <laughs> oh, good. Select the worst colors possible. What uh, are the worst colors? Um, basically anything in uh, Microsoft Excel is automatically the worst, so <laughs> it's kind of just a personal taste. It's, it is finding uh, non-complementary colors, like basically choosing colors that are going to clash as much as possible when placed next to each other. Um, yeah, that's. I'm. It sounds like I'm joking, but I actually do that for real. That's that's a lot of fun. Really no, I believe bright you. Greens, really bright greens and and like really a lot of magenta, as much magenta as possible. A lot of puce. Yes, as much puce as humanly <laughs> possible as well. Do you do you get feedback on these spreadsheet color choices? Like, are you just trying to see if anyone's paying attention to the spreadsheets that you're submitting? Oh no, they no one's allowed to comment on my spreadsheets. <laughs> No, I, I, everybody likes a good spreadsheet, and I think it, it would be very weird if we uh, had, an, like, basically any uh, cabbie spreadsheets that weren't, like, 50%, 60% jokes, and then 40% actual information. Did, uh, so Cabby is 22 people now? Yep. Um, and then, so you're a co-founder, so you're there at the beginning. Like, what, is, what is the origin story of Cappy? Um... So, uh, shit, this is going back, like, 10 years now, uh, 2003. Uh, myself, uh, Chris, our creative director, and Tony Chan, who's another one of the co-founders and one of the senior artists, uh, lead artists on Below, uh, we all went to university together and hung out a bunch and uh, played a lot of games together. Uh, Might have mostly intoxicated. Um, no and, idea what you're talking about. No yeah. familiarity with that at all. No, it's not. I mean, I'm, I'm just I'm lying. Obviously, I don't do that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> of course. But yeah, we went to film. We went to film school together. Uh, all of us kind of went there because we were really interested in games, but also really interested in film at the same time. Um, we all got out of school and got jobs. Uh, I was a, a video editor. Actually, I edited a lot of shitty Canadian television. Um, and really, yeah, yeah. We it sucked. Name some shitty Canadian television you edited. Um, I edited uh, an Outdoor Life Network television show called uh, something like the Women's Fitness Challenge. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was basically like uh, on a, an, an Ontario beach um, and a bunch of extremely athletic women competing in really strange events. This sounds um, great. I edited uh, – the first thing I ever edited was a, a, a video where a medical company flew – 1,500 doctors to a, like, a seven-star resort in Jamaica for like a month and asked them the same 13 questions. And then I had to go in and edit out words from what they had responded about the drug that they were there to, to talk about. Uh, oh. it, was, it, it gave me some real insight into wow. uh, how terrible life as a video editor is. Huh. Um, so that's when we, uh, we, a bunch of us just kind of said, screw this, we should figure out how to get into games. Uh, rented a car, drove from Toronto to GDC, 
uh, without knowing anybody uh, or anything. Uh, met a whole ton of people at GDC. That was GDC 2004 uh, or 2003. 2003. Um, and so we met a whole bunch of people, realized that the games industry was as cool as we kind of thought it would be, but assumed it wouldn't be. Um, and then by the time we got back, there was a whole bunch of other people in Toronto that wanted to make games at the same time. Because there was no work here, we just started making stuff for fun um, and made a bunch of stuff for fun for a couple of years. Uh, the stuff that we made for fun turned out super awesome. Uh, they were like little smartphone or pre-smartphone cell phone games. So like your old Nikea, Nokia that had like uh, green and black screen. Yeah, it's like I primarily played Snake on that one. Yeah, yep. I think you still have one of those, Patrick. Uh, <laughs> Probably. I know I have one in a drawer somewhere. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we made a couple games. They turned out really well, and then we managed to get them in front of some publishers, and uh, in 2005, Disney gave us a bunch of money to make a cell phone game for the movie Cars, and that was where we started the studio. We uh, we didn't actually have a studio when we told them that we did, and... Uh, <laughs> So they, they you know, that's what presidents that. do. Presidents yeah. lie. They have to, they do what they need to do to get things done. No, it was more like a it was more like a misdirection. I would. Say. <laughs> um, so yeah, we worked on on uh, on licensed stuff for like half of our life, and then starting with Critter Crunch, uh, said screw this. Uh, we kind of hated making those games and hated having no creative control, and so we just kind of went 180 degree flip and started doing nothing but our own stuff. Um, so I started out as an artist. Uh, I have no history uh, in, in running studios or anything like that. And, and that's kind of the whole studio is basically people who were uh, super passionate, super excited, and super talented but had never really been given a shot or probably wouldn't have been given a shot. Um, and then fast forward, that's been almost nine years now that we've been running a the studio as a whole, and uh, it's basically taken us that whole giant process to get to the point where we can make something like Super Time Force, where it's basically us just doing it exactly the way that we want to do it, with no pressures other than we want to get the game out because it seems like people want to play it. Um, and that's, I mean, it's kind of a dream scenario for us now, between Super Time Force and Below, uh, this is what we've been working towards for our entire careers, so we better not fuck it up. Yeah. <laughs> now this is this is a perfect segue because I actually wanted to talk to you a little bit about Below. You're a you're a 22 person studio. You've got Super Time Force almost done here, but there's another game that you are working on, which I got to see at PAX East, uh, which I am very very much looking forward to, which is Below. Uh, talk a little bit about that project because you were telling us when we were at PAX that's something that you guys have been working on on and off for a while now, right? Yeah, it's it was a weird. Uh, so below is Cappy's uh, kind of inspired by roguelikes uh, game about exploration and survival and discovery. You play a tiny wanderer arriving at an island. Uh, there's no text or tutorials or uh, real direction in the game at all. Um, you have a sword and a shield. Um, and your entire goal in the game is to explore um, and delve ever deeper into these single screen dungeons that are all procedurally generated. Uh, and if you get hit at all, you start bleeding, and if you don't deal with the bleeding, you will die. Um, and like Time Force, you will die a lot. Um, but in Below, you come back uh, after your last life. You're not playing the same life over and over and over again. You're playing a sequence of lives, a chronology of lives. And so everything you did with your past life uh, is kind of persists and maintains. Um, so yeah, su like while Super Time Force has this kind of weird beginning at a game jam and then pet project, Below also has this really weird uh, history where uh, Chris, our creative director, pitched it to us five or six years ago, a long time ago. Uh, he was super obsessed with old school, hardcore roguelikes, the Ang Bands and Rogues and uh, like Doom Roguelike and a whole bunch of other different ones. Um, and so he pitched this idea of us doing a kind of like Cappy style game inspired by roguelikes with a, like a little touch of Wind Waker, um, and a whole bunch of us just kind of had no friggin' idea what he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> we had never, we were ne we were not immersed in in what roguelikes were. We didn't really know the the history that much. I mean, some of us had played them, um, and so he 
prescribe some roguelikes for us to play, and once we kind of started playing them, we, we definitely understood the concept and loved the idea of making, you know, a kind of atmospheric, aesthetically focused, uh, very cappy uh, take on something as hardcore as, as a roguelike. Um, and, I mean, that was before Demon Souls even had, had hit, or before Spelunky was even that huge of a thing. Um, and so we prototyped it for about a year, back in like 2007 or something like that, 2008. It was a long time ago. Um, and once we kind of had the guts of the game prototyped, we realized that it, we thought it was something super special, wanted to make it, but we were making a bunch of other stuff at the time, so we kind of had to press pause, um, and then we didn't have the chance to come back to it until a couple years ago when we started back up on it and... Uh, yeah, it was a, it's a very strange thing to start a game before this kind of wave of, of uh, hardcore, punishing, super challenging, but super gratifying survivalist games had happened. But it's also super, like, it's great for us because the questions of, like, are people going to play this type of game have already been answered uh, by, you know, Dark Souls and by Spelunky and by FTL and by Don't Starve and all these games... Uh, that are kind of like floating around the same milk as below uh, have, you know, proven out that market for us. And so we can feel super confident doubling down and actually making it, again, exactly the way that we want to make it. And that's why when it was announced at E3 on, uh, during Microsoft's press conference to now, like to PAX East, that was why it kind of stayed super silent and why we were very light on the information because we wanted to make sure that we had the time to let it percolate and, and filter down into the exact type of experience we wanted to show people. Sprinkle that, that Jim Guthrie musical pixie dust on it and uh, get the art to a point where we could really show people that like the scale of the game was a, was a critical component. We could show people that um, the, the darkness and the tone of it is kind of what the game is all about, not just about the sword and the shield combat and that kind of stuff. So it took us a while to figure it out, but that, again, like it's, it's a very kind of similar theme uh, at the studio. We're just having the time with the games to like sit and feel and, and play them a hell of a lot is, is I think, why uh, I, uh, knock on wood, believe that they both are going to turn out really well. Is, is it weird to unearth a game years later and, and look at a, a, you know, a prototype that you know, maybe you were excited about at the time, but then seeing it, you know, because obviously the form that you know, we played it in, the form that people have seen in the, the trailers you guys have released is, is not, not what that prototype looks like. But like, is it, what is it like to look at something like years later and be like, all right, let's try and make some sense of this and, and take it forward? In the case of Below, we all like we knew we were going to come back to it. It was it was in some cases we've shelved projects and then come back to them. That's super weird, and it's like you know bumping into an ex a while later when there's like you know not that much in common anymore, but you still have to have a conversation. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, uh, with with Below, we just we were always playing it. We were always talking about it. We knew that this was going to be the project that was coming next. We just needed to get to that time. So it never went away. It just kind of like it it sat right next to us, staring at us, tapping its foot consistently um, until we could get back to it. Uh, was Pax East the first time you let other people sort of get their hands on that game? Yeah, I mean, other than friends and family, no one had ever seen anything about it. I mean, there was maybe five people out of the studio that had played the game uh, ever, even including the prototype uh, outside of PAX East. So PAX East was, was terrifying in, in yeah. that. I mean, we were crazily excited because we believe in the game, and we really do think that uh, it is special, but you never really know how people are going to react. You have no idea if, um, if they're going to actually get the idea that we're not going to tell them anything. Like, they were just shoving a controller in their hands, putting headphones on their ears and saying, enjoy, uh, yeah. hopefully. Uh, and and uh, we were blown away by it. I mean, it was, the response was way crazier than we had expected. Um, not from the, like, yeah, there was tons of people there and that's super important to us, but the way that people played it was the most important piece for us. People sat down, put on the headphones, and just kind of started moving closer and closer to the screen as the first kind of five minutes of the demo went through. And, 
basically nobody finished the demo, which is also awesome for us. Uh, there was like maybe five or six people that actually found uh, the the end. It's, it wasn't really mm-hmm. an end. It was more kind of just a cutoff, but um, that was also really inspiring to us because it meant that even in a, a small slice, there was enough to explore um, and that discovery was not going to be something that you just trip and fall and like, oh, there's all these wonderful things happening in the game. Uh, it was great for us to see. And people, uh, you know, between Time Force and, and Below, there's a lot of uh, difference. I mean, they're really kind of the polar opposite of games in many ways. Um, but seeing people react... And in a lot of cases, the same people react super positively to both. Has been uh, the it gives you it gives you a lot of a lot of feels as a developer to to see that happen. It's been interesting too to watch how you guys have you know started talking about the game too because it's something that I just discussed with you uh, when we were checking the game out of PAX East. But you know none of the trailers you guys have put out uh, you know showcase the combat or or. Know, sort of any of the intensity of the game, they're all very much mood, atmosphere, tone, yeah. uh, kind of giving a vibe for the game uh, as opposed to traditionally what you see, you know, in you know video game trailers, which is you know set up and then boom, cut to exactly what the player is going to be doing moment to moment. So I, step and then yeah. So what, why why have you guys taken that approach as opposed to uh, you know even something like Super Time Force where it jumps just straight into hey you're shooting the shit out of dudes yeah we actually had dubstep in the Super Time Force trailer <laughs> but it was <laughs> ironically I will say um, uh, no it's for below like for Time Force uh, if you you have to understand that that game is hectic as crap um, and kind of meant to be insanely so um, but with below it's very different that game is um, if played the way that uh, we believe that it needs to be played, uh, it is paced and it is methodical and it is uh, very uh, almost calm around the periods of insanity or, or intensity. Um, and so that's the part that we really feel important to play up. That's that's what the game is to us as developers is like long uh, kind of like chill moments around really intense one step away from death combat. Um, And the other part of it too is that everything in in Below, uh, and and I can say the same thing about Super Time Force, there's very purposeful aesthetic choices and and musical choices and audio choices. Um, And whereas in Time Force it's meant to make things even crazier, now in Below the gym's music and the style of the art and the scale of the art and the tilt shift, um, it's all meant to hopefully provide, like, focus and almost, like, tunnel you into, you know, playing as that tiny tiny character. And, you know, maybe that's partially why we have to show it in in slow, like, more longer clips is because uh, that's what the game really is. That's how we look at the game as as developers. And yeah, there, it's it gets crazily intense and super freaky at times. But um, yeah, it, it it is very much about the tone. Um, and and that's I mean, it, part of it is what we've taken away from uh, you know what we learned about making games of that sort from from sorcery as well. Awesome. Well, uh, we should we should transition over to uh, a little bit of news, and then we'll take some questions before we uh, roll this out. Uh, I decided, for whatever reason, to just break news on Saturday. Yeah, what are you doing, man? <laughs> a good time. Yeah. Uh, I I broke the the news that uh, Infinity Ward and NeverSoft are sort of merging up to become a single studio. I've actually known about it for. for uh, probably maybe a month and change, but wasn't in a position to say anything about it. And then on a Friday evening, deep into Friday evening, uh, I got access to an internal memo that allowed me to to go forward and actually report on it. But I was um, let's let's call it. Uh, I had been I had been drinking, so yeah. I couldn't. I wasn't going to write that story. Uh, nor did I was I was not in a position at 10:30 at night on a Friday night to be writing and breaking news. So I was like, ah, I guess if someone beats me in the next 12 hours, I'll just have to live with it. Uh, so I waited until uh, Saturday morning. But yeah, Infinity Ward uh, and Neversoft, you know, best known probably for Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, uh, also for 
working on the Guitar Hero series uh, for the last couple of years, uh, I guess the last five, six years, uh, they went into a support role uh, with uh, the Call of Duty games um, alongside Raven Software, uh, which it must be weird for a lot of those studios. I mean, I guess on one hand, Activision isn't just, uh, you know, wholesale laying off and closing down studios that they don't seem all that interested in anymore, um, but uh, they do seem to be kind of just rolling everything into the Call of Duty machine if they're incapable of producing what, what Activision wants. And so Neversoft, which is literally, if you look up the address uh, with Infinity War, they are just, like, down the street from one another. So they are, they're very close. Uh, it's, complex. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so they're going to be rolling up together, and uh, they're, they're getting a new studio head, and it's, you know, unclear exactly how that's going to shake out. But, you know, as someone that, you know, Alex, we were talking about, Call of Duty Ghosts uh, when the, they announced uh, Advanced Warfare uh, last week, and you know, Ghost was not received very well, even by folks that I know who really enjoy the Call of Duty games. So it seems like Infinity Ward, you know, which lost a lot of its top tier talent, uh, you know, no doubt there are still passionate, talented people there, uh, but clearly lost a lot of the creative vision that was driving that studio in its in its exodus from a couple years back. You know, I don't know if the merging with NeverSoft is going to fix that, but it certainly seems like that's a studio that could use a shot in the arm uh, now that they've got about you know three three years to build the next game. Yeah, I mean, my understanding uh, going into this was that NeverSoft really didn't have a lot of talent left. I mean, they had gone through multiple layoff rounds, I think, uh, and then, like you said, Infinity Ward had obviously had its exodus of, of people as well. So, I mean, this whole move seems to make a certain amount of sense in, in, in the way that you know, it seems like maybe this will help, you know, sort of restaff Infinity Ward in a way that, you know, they would ha otherwise have had to just do a bunch of hiring while, meanwhile, Neversoft was just kind of sitting there in this, like, limbo of support role after support role after Tony Hawk, you know, sort of got canceled after uh, Guitar Hero stopped being a franchise that anyone, you know, at Activision wanted to support. So, I mean, it makes sense. Really, the only sad thing about this is just the idea that Neversoft is just kind of going away as an entity. Uh, there is a legacy there. There is, you know, uh, a, a certain reverence people have for, obviously, those early Tony Hawk games. Uh, the first couple of Guitar Hero games they made were really good. You know, there's, there, was, there was stuff they made that was, that was pretty awesome, but, I mean, Neversoft, as it existed at this point, didn't seem like it was even really much of a studio, so much as just like a, okay, we need help with this stuff, just do this kind of place. I think it's yeah. going to be super awesome for, for the people who are at both studios because nobody... Everybody gets into games to make them. Nobody gets into games to help somebody else make them. Right. Um, and so for the people at Neversoft and the people at Infinity Ward, like being put together into a, a, a full studio in, instead of kind of maybe being pieces of two different studios, I think it's going to give a lot of people a chance to, to actually build something instead of helping someone build something. And I think we're constantly surprised by how good of stuff people can make when they're given their kind of like, hey guys, like let's let's actually do this, give it a shot, see what happens. A lot of good stuff comes out of that. And hopefully there's enough of those talented people between the two studios that they can Voltron up and 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 give it a real go. I, I think it's and plus like any chance that anybody has to um, you know keep people to, like keep good people employed making good products, it's it's way, way smarter than like, you know, letting them go and then having to rebuild from scratch the next time you need a team. So I think it's a it's kind of a, like, it's, it's hard to look at it and be super jazzed about it because of, like you said, Neversoft's history and because of Infinity Ward's history. But at the same time, I think it's super exciting for those two teams, and I would love to see them come out and just, like, blow everyone's minds with something crazy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not hard to imagine the story... Uh having been <laughs> slightly different and what we're hearing is, oh, actually they're just shuttering Neversoft and, you know, they're hiring a couple of the, of key talent but everyone else is going away. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not privy to uh, whether there are any layoffs happening and as a result of the merger, usually there is usually some redundancy um, if it may, that may be more infrastructure than in terms of design talent but, uh, you know, it, it seems like it's going to be uh, a relative, not not so much a bloodbath as as some of these uh, can be. Um, let's see what else. Uh, there, blah, blah, blah. I didn't get a chance to look over it too closely, but the Oculus uh, shot back this morning uh, to Zenimax uh, regarding the 
the claims that were being made by Zenimax last week vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Wall Street Journal um, and the Oculus technology. I'll just, I'll just read the Oculus response because it's not uh, that long. Uh, it says, uh, We are disappointed but not surprised by Zenimax actions and we will prove that all of his claims are false. In the meantime, we'd like to clarify a few key points. Uh, there is not a line of Zenimax code or any of its technology in any Oculus products. John Carmack did not take any intellectual property from Zenimax. Zenimax has misstated the purposes and language of the Zenimax non-disclosure agreement that Palmer Lucky signed. Palmer Lucky is the founder of Oculus. Uh, a key reason that Carmack left Zenimax in August of 2013 was that Zenimax prevented John from working on VR and stopped investing in VR games across the company. Zenimax canceled VR support for Doom 3 BFG edition when Oculus refused Zenimax demands for a non-dilutable equity stake in Oculus. Zenimax did not pursue claims against Oculus for IP or technology. Zenimax has never contributed any IP or technology to Oculus, and only after the Facebook deal was announced has Zenimax now made these claims through its lawyers. Despite the fact that the full source code for the Oculus SDK is available online, Zenimax has never identified any stolen code or technology, uh, which seems like a pretty forceful pushback yeah. by uh, Oculus uh, in terms of, or I should say Facebook, uh, yeah. in terms of uh, you know refuting... Uh, some of uh, Zenimax points, at least you know, in the court of public opinion. Obviously, all a lot of this is puffing their chest, uh, hoping the other one, I guess, will back down before actual lawsuits uh, are filed. Yeah, I mean, this seems like a battle of whose lawyers are the most expensive in this case, and who's going to you know come at this the hardest. Uh, in my in my estimation, I'm guessing that Facebook probably has the most uh, expensive and therefore the most aggressive lawyers in this situation. I, I said last week, I think this is all just going to end in a settlement. I still think that, even with this pushback, you know, Zenimax will get something out of it, but, you know, what they're pushing what they're pushing for is a piece. I don't think they're going to get much of a piece, if anything, but they'll get some money out of it, just because that's how these things always tend to go, even if Zenimax doesn't have a case. How lucky are we that they actually wrote a response that uh, is illegible by humans instead of... <laughs> I was super stoked. I read it. I was like, holy crap, I understand all of the points they're making. Right? Yeah. Beautiful thing. I would like to thank uh, them for that. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of, you know, I, I've, you know, when I was reporting on, you know, like the Infinity Ward stuff and, and in other cases where I've had to look through, you know, legal paperwork, I mean, it's just, that stuff is not, <laughs> it's inscrutable to the average person. Oftentimes, I, I am taking things, giving it to a person just so they can tell me, like what? What does the, What does this mean? It's, it's like a translator for English to English. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I thought it was interesting that that Facebook uh, slash Oculus chose to use such clear language and to do it publicly. Uh, which I, I have to imagine, if it's being done publicly, they they feel a certain amount of uh, confidence in their ability to to push back on the the narrative. Um, you know, I guess maybe you know. Maybe to Alex's point, it is all just pomp and circumstance uh, to to get to a number that is written on a check, so everyone shuts up and moves on with their lives. But nonetheless, this is definitely sort of the last thing I expected to be playing out uh, after this purchase. Um, but nonetheless, here we are. Yeah. Uh, I don't think anything else really happened over the weekend or this morning, or news-wise. No, not not too much. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, let's ask people. If you have any questions, questions. I have a question. Uh -huh. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so, President Nathan, this is very important. I need to know. How is uh, the Critter Crunch sequel going, and when will you be able to announce a release date for that? We're, we're, we're really deep into doing uh, photorealistic uh -huh. vomiting, rainbow vomiting. Okay. Uh, probably like two to three years more of R&D. Uh, okay. Got to get in on that that Oculus for like VR rainbow barfing. Uh, I'm on board. I would. I don't know. We've never really talked about doing a, a, a Critic Crunch sequel, but at some point in time, like it's the game is just too like again. We have a thing at Cappy which is like we've been using for Super Time Force, but I think it also applies to Critic Crunch, which is like the right kind of stupid. Um, and I think I, I think Critic Crunch has some of that, and I still love that game. Um, so yeah, maybe once we get the barf tech down. Uh, okay. We have there's 22 people at the studio, 21 working on Barf Tap right now. Okay, good. Yeah, that sounds like the right number of people working on that. Sounds like you've got this all together. That's great to hear. That's, Just wanted to put it out yeah, there. That's, that's why I have my job. But that's why I'm I'm the president because I can focus uh, resources intelligently like that. Uh, 
the other news we should talk about, I, I don't know why I forgot about it. Uh, yeah. I don't know if it's, it's – maybe it's not news news, but suspicious pictures. Project Beast? Yes. <laughs> Project Beast. Uh, I couldn't believe that you were not going to bring up Project Beast. I'm I sorry. don't know why. It's it was it was in my notes, and then it just slipped my mind, and then the chat freaked out, going Project Beast. But yes, over the weekend, uh, screenshots uh, from a very compressed-looking uh, video game trailer uh, for a game called Project Beast came out of uh, 4chan. So I guess uh, let me take this time to uh, apologize to 4chan for all I have said about them. Uh, for being respond now being responsible for uh, some screenshots taken from what is clearly a trailer for a game called Project Beast that uh, looks way too it does not it's, it's hard to imagine any of this is faked it really does look like this is a legitimate leak uh, the only the only way I can imagine someone is getting access to this is if somebody, somehow this was an E3 reveal that they have access to early assets in in some capacity because. Uh, even throughout uh, the the thread on uh, a NeoGAF, uh, there were additional screens coming out uh, from various people who have access to uh, that trailer. And uh, I, so the rumor goes that the you know Miyazaki, who was behind Demon Souls and Dark Souls, who did not work on Dark Souls 2, uh, went off to work on a new project. And folks that have examined the credits of Dark Souls and Dark Souls 2 have essentially. Uh, come up with a very credible theory that most of the talent, you know, not, you know, to say nothing about Dark Souls 2, but a lot of the the key veterans, let's say, that seems like a better way to put it, uh, from Dark Souls left to go work on this new project, um, and uh, that it seems uh, between hints that uh, Shuhei Yoshida has been making on Twitter that there is probably going to be a PS4 exclusive, uh, or at least you know debut exclusive. Uh, from Miyazaki, and if we're seeing trailers like we are now, uh, which showcase sort of a Western, maybe a little more action-themed, but still very much Dark Souls with fog gates and everything sort of game for the PS4, I literally could not be... And I use literally because I want to. I literally could not be more excited for this game. <laughs> literally impossible for you to be more excited. Huh? I don't... Well, I get... Okay. Once I actually play the game, I guess I could be more excited. So maybe I maybe okay. proper use of literally. Yeah, might be. But uh, you know, hard to say too much else because it's you know it's all just kind of like getting fun and excited over uh, leaks and stuff like that. But uh, Nathan, when you see stuff like this, when you see like leaks of trailers, when you see people talking about a game, clearly not even in an unfinished form, but not even the form that this developer probably wanted to be presented and announced. Like, does this give you like palpable anxiety to like to imagine what it would be like if a if a game like yours was kind of leaked out in this fashion? You gotta. I mean. Yeah, absolutely, but you have to think about it this way. The response to Project Beast has been so, like, basically nonstop, 100% undying admiration for the project. So it's got to be, like, sure, you're, you're going to be super pissed that somebody screwed you over and put it out there, but at least there's, like, the flip side to it, which is everybody is just, like, tap it right into my brain immediately. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think that there's anybody who wants their stuff out there early, uh, earlier than they want. But if you're going to have it happen, at least it's awesome for them that the response is so positive. Um, in fact, literally could not be more positive. <laughs> All right, you may have actually had the, uh, the best use of the term literally. It's, like it's, it's, a, it's a nightmare to have your stuff get out uh, when you don't want it to, but it's also like... Uh, reality of the of the industry now. I mean, very very few people have the opportunity to go from from planning all the way through to execution of uh, like the announcement of a game uh, on that scale without something coming out or someone scooping it a little bit early. Um, and that, <laughs> that's just a reality you have to deal with, and you have to. I guess like I would be praying that people would react the same way as they did for Project Beast. If I was Miyazaki, if I was if I was Sony, and I was actually behind the game, uh, this probably worked out massively in their favor. Um, so, you know, could be made worse at least. Uh, the uh, the other piece of news that people are mentioning is that uh, on Friday, uh, Mark Rain uh, tweeted out that we were going to find out the future of Unreal Tournament uh, this week. Uh, they are going to announce. Something related to Unreal Tournament. They're doing a, a Twitch stream, uh, and I, I believe some of the tweets I saw from other, other Epic employees uh, implied 
there would be you know heavy community aspect, which I'm not you know not surprised that you know for a game or for a series that has been so invested in in modders and creators in the past. Uh, Alex, were, are you uh, Unreal Tournament guy at all? I was years and years ago, but not to the extent that people like Brad and Jeff were. Uh, oh, I was super were... in Unreal Tournament. Uh, yeah. Facing Worlds, my friend. Facing Worlds. Anyone that knows what Unreal Tournament is all about knows that the only map that matters in Unreal Tournament is Facing Worlds. Yeah, that's probably true. I uh, was horrible at it, so I never really got super into it, because anytime I would go online and play against people, I would just get destroyed constantly. Um, and those were not games where, you know, you were really encouraged to, you know, play offline to sort of get better at them. It's just like, no, you go there for the multiplayer. And that was, I think, that was where my love affair of uh, multiplayer online gaming sort of uh, stopped, kind of st- it had it hit a hard stop. You know, like, that's where I kind of said, you know, maybe this isn't really the genre for me uh, so much. So I, I, I sort of credit that those games were fun. They also ruined multiplayer gaming for me entirely. Hmm. Are people assuming that this one's going to be free to play, like I am? Uh, it's I'm... it's hard to imagine that they that that it wouldn't be. I mean, especially yeah. looking at what you know, uh, ID has done with uh, was it Quake Live? I think is yep. their their Epic. online browser based one. Uh, Epic and, and Digital Extremes have some old ties, and and Warframe obviously clawing yeah. it like crazy. Um, not that those ties mean anything other than it's interesting to see them both doing, like, it will be interesting to see them both doing uh, first-person shooter kind of, like, arena style with free-to-play. I'm just going to assume that that's what's going to happen. And, yeah, I could see, I mean, Epic has proven time and time again that they really understand how to put IP, like, put stuff out. They, they're they not one of those, like, companies that is five years behind everybody else, so... I wouldn't be surprised if they clobbered that and then made a bajillion dollars. Yeah, I mean, earlier this year, uh, Epic and uh, Mozilla showed off uh, UE4 running in a browser. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if this was a chance for Epic to show, hey, we're gonna we're gonna do free to play, we're gonna do browser, and we're gonna show that these games don't have to look like they came from the late '90s, or early 2000s, yeah. like that you can do like a really amazing looking game in a browser. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they did a client too, but it, it, given what they've shown off of what you know what uh, UE4 is capable of, not to mention that it seems like a lot of what they're doing with UE4 is in many ways a direct response to the rise of Unity yeah, in the last five years. Uh, it seems like you know Unity, while a very capable engine, is not you know at the edges of technology like the UE has always been in the past. So it wouldn't shock me if if Epic tries to leverage that facet of what they've been known for and try and present, you know, browser games as, you know, being something that can stand toe-to-toe with what you expect from, you know, something that you install uh, from a client on your on your desktop. So I'm curious to see it, but I, I, think you're, I think you're right, Nathan. I think f- I would be genuinely shocked if it was anything other than free-to-play. And well, let's uh, let's uh, close out with a with a question for for Nathan. People were asking because uh, you had name dropped, you know, a bunch of prototypes that uh, Cappy has worked on in the past. Would you guys ever think about doing something with those prototypes, or does that scare the hell out of you to show anyone what the games used to be like? Um, some of it, yeah, we'll definitely be showing some of it. Um, I, I'm really excited to show people the original Time Force versus the finished Time Force. Um, a whole bunch of people in Toronto have had a chance to play the original Jam version of Super Time Force, um, but no one else really has had a chance as well to see it. So that's there's a whole bunch of stuff that we would love to love to let people play in some way. Even the below prototype, I think after we're, uh, you know, when the game gets to a point where we're we're finished with it, I'd love to see. I'd love to see what people thought of that as well. It's a very different thing than what we have, but it's also kind of awesome in its own right. We do a lot of like jam and prototype sessions in the studio, and there's a lot of crazy crap that comes out of it. So. At some point, we would love to, when we have a chance to breathe, uh, right now doing launching one project and then hitting it pretty hard on a second is not giving us much time to think about anything else, but once Time Force hits, maybe we'll have a chance to go back and figure out a way to, to get some of the smaller projects or, or jam projects or prototype projects uh, into people's hands. Alex, what are you, uh, what are you up to this week? 
Oh, uh, let's see. Um, I am going to finish the last two chapters of Child of Light today, and then I'm going to start writing that review. Um, I, I, I played a, a, a fair amount of that this week. I did spring cleaning, so my Sunday disappeared to that. So yeah. I, I didn't play too much of it, but it, now that I have access to five different characters, I'm, I'm, I'm. The game doesn't. The game doesn't give you a good reason to switch between the characters. I, I Even have when found. They die during battle. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, but I haven't encountered too much of that yet. Yeah. But I started forcing myself to, like, switch characters. And once you force yourself, if only for like to vary up your tactics, not because the enemies demand it, but just because it's more interesting and it feels yes. crappy to be ignoring four characters. Uh, it's pretty. It's pretty cool. Like I, I like the the rhythm you get when you realize you can be swapping them really fast. You know, bring a guy in with the the, the little uh, the mousy man that's got like the double arrow hit and, and things like that. I'm I'm enjoying the the tactics there. I just wish the game encouraged you to do it more often than it feels like the enemies force you to. Yeah, yeah. It's it's and the game's not very good at explaining like what that the benefit of that stuff is. Um, but yeah, I mean, as, as I've gotten deeper and deeper into it, as I'm, I'm, I think I've got like two chapters left. Like, it does become a little bit more satisfying. Like when you switch those characters up. So hopefully, I'll have a review of that probably by tomorrow. Um, I will be playing some more Mario Kart this week. Uh, I may do a couple of Bombasticas uh, over the course of this month of some old Nintendo racing games that I'm particularly fond of uh, in in celebration of of new Mario Kart. Uh, I may start with one of those this week, um, perhaps with the original Super Mario Kart. We'll see. Um, but other than that, that's kind of what I got right now on my plate. What do you got coming up? Uh, I'm, I might take the afternoon and try and finish Daylight. I, I do want to see the the rest of that. I don't think my opinion on it is going to change very much. That, sure. That game is not very good. But I, supposedly it is like, like 90 minutes long, which means my quick look somehow encompassed two-thirds of the game. Oops. <laughs> uh, not what I meant to do, but uh, it seems like that game is awful short. So I want to go back and, and finish that just to, to get a sense of, of what it is. Uh, and, uh, you know, I like covering uh, my bases with those horror games. But uh, probably this week is actually going to be, you know, a lot for me is, is wrapping my head around uh, E3 planning, uh, getting certain to reach out to more folks, uh, figure out who we can uh, bring in uh, for uh, our, our nightly shows because it's not that far off, um, even though it, I'm trying not to think about it. I am forced to think about it because of my job. Uh, so I'll probably be working on stuff like that this week. Uh, so, Nathan. Yes. Super Time Force is launching, what, May 15th, 14th? May 14th. May 14th. Uh, yep. 60 and Xbox One. 360 and Xbox One, same day. Eventually, maybe one day PC, nod your head. Like, I'm just going to stare and say no comment. Okay. Okay. All right. Um and and then so below is is much further off right like that's not yeah, even, we don't even have a clue when that one's coming um the worst thing that we can do is is give ourselves and fans the false expectation of something uh so yeah 2013 or 2014 2015 2013 <laughs> 20, 2013 yeah so if you just, play Super Time Force go back in time you have to buy Super Time Force to go back in time to get the game. Oh. That is like that's even better than like a, <laughs> a trial pack in or like a, a a beta key inside of another game. It's the actual game inside of a time travel machine inside of Super Time Force. Awesome. All right. Well, where can uh, people continue to to follow uh, your exploits on the internet? What is? Uh, you you can you can follow us on Twitter. We're at Cappy Games, uh, or you can just go to CapybaraGames.com. We uh, tend to keep that quite updated, but uh, but tw we we are very Twitter, and, and we also have a, a really rad Tumblr if you like video game art from our studio, which is cappygames.tumblr.com, um, and we post a ton of ridiculous gifts from Super Time Force and artwork from below and uh, vines that Chris takes of strange studio stuff and so on. So between the website and the Tumblr and the Twitter, that's that's like you got all of the social media up in there. Awesome. Well, uh, Alex, I will talk to you on Friday, and uh, Nathan, uh, really appreciate you uh, joining us this morning, and uh, looking forward to finally playing Super Time Force, and uh, hopefully yeah. uh, checking out uh, some more below as the as the year goes on. Thanks for having me, guys. Super fun. All right. See you, Alex. See ya. <laughs>